Welcome to worship. I'm glad that we could be together again online. And I know that um, you are... Welcome. I'm excited that we could be online again. I know that it's different, but I thank the Lord for the technology that allows us to gather um, when we can't be together and still uh, be together as a church just um, through a shared uh, service or uh, thing like that as we meet together in our homes. And so, uh, greetings, welcome uh, to worship on this Sunday, December 20th, or whenever you're watching. I wanted to start our time together today with a reading from the Psalms. I'll be reading Psalm 108 um, as a call to worship. My heart is confident in you, O God. No wonder I can sing your praises. Wake up, lyre and harp. I will make the dawn with my song. I will wake the dawn with my song. I will thank you, Lord, among all people. I will sing your praises among the nations, for your unfailing love is higher than the heavens. Your faithfulness reaches to the clouds. Be exalted, O God, above the highest heaven. May your glory shine over all the earth. Amen and amen. Let's pray together. Almighty God, we thank you for the gift that is today. We thank you that though we cannot be together, we can still gather uh, and be Uh, together virtually online through this service. We appreciate um, the technology and and we we praise you for it and are grateful for it. Lord, bless our lives this day as we open a bit of ourselves up to to your word and what you might say to us. In Jesus' name, amen. The big story of the Bible is all about the one true God who chooses to love unlovable people. After Moses brought the people of Israel safely out of slavery in Egypt, they came to a mountain called Sinai, where God made a special covenant promise to love and care for them. Exodus 34, verses 6-7 through seven, And the Lord God passed in front of Moses, proclaiming, The Lord, the Lord, the compassionate and gracious God, slow to anger, abounding in love and faithfulness, maintaining love to thousands, and forgiving wickedness, rebellion, and sin. Yet he does not leave the guilty unpunished. We do not find a quotation of these verses in the New Testament, but we do find the heart of it in the Gospel of John. John chapter 1, verse 14. The Word became flesh and made His dwelling among among us. We have seen His glory, the glory of the one and only Son, who came from the Father, full of grace and truth. God's glory came down at Sinai, shrouded by a cloud. But at the birth of Jesus, God's glory came down shrouded in the human form. At Sinai, God dwelt in a tent called the tabernacle, and in John's gospel, God made his dwelling among us. In the Greek, this literally means God tabernacled among us. God dwelt among us in the person of Jesus. God came to the Israelites full of grace and love, so Jesus, in John's gospel, comes to us full of grace and truth. This leaves us with a question. Aren't we all guilty in our sin? So then how can God both love and punish the guilty? The answer is that God can give us love and satisfy his justice by taking the punishment we deserve upon himself. Jesus, God's made flesh, pays for our sins with his own life so that we may live. Therefore the cross is where justice and love meet. Now as we light the candle of love, we thank God for who he is. We praise him for his compassionate, gracious, and loving character, and that he came to rescue us from our sins and grant us eternal life. We thank God for loving us enough to take our punishment upon himself at the cross. At Christmas, we thank God that when he came to this world, he didn't come shrouded by a cloud, but fully revealed in a small baby boy named Jesus. Let us pray. We are surrounded by your love, Lord. Thank you for the gift of people we love. Help us not to take them for granted. You are the greatest of our gifts, Jesus. We cannot praise you enough. In our name, amen.
thank you, Frank and Crystal, Han and Courtney, for uh, taking time to do the Advent reading for us. I realized when I made the first video clip uh, that Sadie also made an appearance, and um, so she's with me today, so she may make several more, and um, maybe you'll get a kick out of that. Uh, so I brought her with me today, so I don't have to record uh, by myself, I guess. And so, uh, anyways, we'll just, it is what, that is what it is, and uh, I hope you get a kick out of it as I kind of chuckling to myself as well uh, about her making an appearance here today. As we turn our thoughts to prayer, I'd like to encourage you to pray along with me. I'm just going to pray for us and all the things that are going on, pray for health and pray for our families and our friends and all of those kind of things. But would you join me uh, in prayer before we have our scripture lesson today? Almighty God, we are grateful to gather together. We are grateful uh, for our families, for our friends. And today, Lord, we would pause to ask that you would bless them, that you would remember your promise to come near to us when we need you. And Lord, for those that we care about and those that we love, we pray that you would bless them and keep them and that you would watch over them. Father, we also would pray that as we um, head into the week of Christmas, with all the busyness and the excitement and uh, the uh, time with family, or if uh, we're unable to gather with family this year, just the longing in our hearts to be together, all of those kind of things um, are happening in our lives right now. And we would ask, Almighty God, that you would be in the midst of all of that. May uh, we uh, see you this Christmas, see your hope, uh, see the peace that you offer, see the joy that you are extending to us. And may most of all, Lord, this Christmas, we experience your love. In Jesus' name, amen and amen. Well, you know, it's uh, true, we're just about there, right? Christmas is just around the corner now, and this week will be busy for many of us, finishing up gifts and wrapping and all of the last minute things that we typically do and um, there will be a hustle and a bustle about our lives leading up uh, to the quiet of Christmas and that's one of the things that I kind of often have reflected upon myself is that there's all of that busyness right before and then after the excitement of Christmas morning there's a there's a quiet and maybe uh, there's something there for us in the, those quiet moments of the day uh, to hear the voice of God and what it means uh, that he sent his son Jesus uh, to, to be like us and, and, and to save us. What a story. It's the greatest story ever told, and we are participating in that um, as we proclaim faith in Jesus. And so uh, let's, let's just do that this Christmas. Everyone should have received a Christmas letter from me. Uh, this week from the church, and I hope, as I said in that letter, that it is for you always Christmas and never winter. If you didn't get that letter, I, it was not intentional. I did my best to get include everyone and get all the addresses. So if you didn't, and would you please email me so I can correct that, and then I'll respond with the, with the letter so that you can read it yourself. And the biggest, uh, not only was there a little reflection in there, but kind of the biggest information was about our Christmas Eve service. We'll be doing that virtually. It won't be a long service. I won't have all the singing and things. It'll just uh, simply be a candlelight reflection that your family can participate in. And to enable you to do that, we are going to have candles outside of the church uh, in underneath the carport starting on Monday, December 21st and going, of course, till uh, Christmas Eve. And they'll be in a cooler so you can stop by, uh, get the candle, and if you want to grab one of the, you know, the protectors that go on to stop the wax from dripping, uh, you're welcome to do that. Uh, but they'll be there, uh, stop by at your leisure and, and pick those things up. And I would encourage you to participate with us. If you can't participate at 4.30, that's when we're going to live stream. That's okay. Just uh, I'll make it public right after that's over. And then you can watch it whenever it's convenient uh, for your family. One of the things that would be kind of neat is if we could 
uh, sh share some pictures. You could email them to me. You could put them on uh, Facebook, I suppose, and just of our congregation participating in candlelight. I think that would be neat uh, for everyone to see. And then if, if you put them there or would send, send them to me, um, as soon as we get back together, maybe we can uh, send, show one another those pictures, which would be exciting. Today I want us to look at the Gospel of Luke, uh, the first chapter. This is uh, the text where the angel visits Mary and they have a conversation. And so we're going to kind of look in on that conversation and, and see w what we can take away from it. Uh, to set the stage for the passage, though, uh, I, you kind of have to read between, between the lines. This story can become so familiar that we miss some of the details that all of the readers would have known when Luke uh, was writing this uh, to Theopolis, uh, the gentleman that had asked him to write uh, this account. And where we find ourselves uh, in Luke chapter 1 is in Nazareth. Now, Nazareth, we know it as the town Jesus grew up in and all of that, but that wasn't the case then. Nazareth was a, a nowhere place. It, no one came to visit. It wasn't a destination. It was just a town, a small town, with simple people just wanting to live. That's what Nazareth was. There wasn't any great fanfare or anything like that. Uh, in fact, most likely if you were from Nazareth, you were looked down upon by those from the kind of bigger places like Jerusalem or Jericho or some of the towns that um, have been, you know, in history more more popular towns, destinations, trade centers. Nazareth wasn't any of those things. It was just a place on a map. And uh, the people that lived there likely stayed there because their families were there. And um, they weren't noticed by anybody. It was, it was that, kind of, that kind of thing. That's where Mary was from. That's where Joseph was from, a place like that. Uh, Mary wasn't the mother of Jesus yet, of course, and she's going, that's happening, and we're getting a window into that, which tells us, though, that she's likely uh, 15 or 16 years old. She's pledged to be married to a carpenter named Joseph. And so Mary, at this time, when the angel meets with her, she would be looking forward to the cultural expectations of becoming a wife and raising children and all, all of those things so that her and Joseph could make it in the world. These were everyday, simple people, the kind no one really notices, everyday, simple people, the kind no one really cares to consider. They're the kind of people that work hard, that love their small town, their families, love their families, love their God, and they just want to live. This is who Gabriel comes to speak with. Everyday people. And I think we shouldn't lose that detail in the story of Christmas. And I think we shouldn't lose that detail because God came to people like us. That's why that detail is important. God came to every day, simple people just wanting to live from places that nobody really notices, people like us. And God came to them and he asked them to join his plan. He asked them to experience his presence. He asked them to entrust themselves to his will and see that will accomplished as they walked in faith with him. Christmas invites us at least to consider the same. How might God be inviting me and how might God be inviting you to experience his presence, to join his will, to entrust yourself to his story and see that play out in your life? So let's read this passage, Luke chapter 1, verses 26 to 38. I'll be reading from the New Living Translation. Uh, it, and, and just so, so you know, let's read uh, together. In the sixth month of Elizabeth's pregnancy, to learn about Elizabeth, you need to read the first part of chapter one, and I encourage you to do that uh, this week. But Elizabeth um, is John the Baptist's mom, and you can read all about that in the verses preceding. But in the sixth month of Elizabeth's pregnancy, God sent the angel Gabriel to Nazareth, a village in Galilee. 
to a virgin named Mary. She was engaged to be married to a man named Joseph, a descendant of King David. Gabriel appeared to her and said, Greetings, favored woman. The Lord is with you. Confused and disturbed, Mary tried to think, What could the angel mean? Don't be afraid, Mary, the angel told her. For you have found favor with God. You will conceive and give birth to a son, and you will name him Jesus. He will be very great and will be called the Son of the Most High. The Lord God will give him the throne of his ancestor David, and he will reign over Israel forever. His kingdom will never end. Mary asked the angel, but how can this happen? I'm a virgin. The angel replied, the Holy Spirit will come upon you. The power of the Most High will overshadow you. So the baby to be born will be holy, and he will be called the Son of God. What's more, your relative Elizabeth has become pregnant in her old age. People used to say she was barren, but she has conceived a son and is now in her sixth month. For nothing is impossible with God. And Mary responded, I am the Lord's servant. May everything you have said about me come true. And then the angel left her. Much can be said about this passage, but I want us to consider just the final two verses today. Verse 37, nothing is impossible with God. And verse 38 Mary's response, I am the Lord's servant. May everything you have said about me come true. In those words, Mary has just stepped into the impossible with God. That always sounds good in the Bible when these characters step into the impossible with God. But what about for you and for me? Can we step into the impossible with God? Is what Gabriel is saying just to Mary? And of course, a lot of it is, right? Only she would be a virgin who would be with child. That was just to her, unique to her. She was, of all women, the one to be the mother of Jesus. So much of what he says is for, for Mary, But what about that verse 37? Nothing is impossible with God. Was that just for her or is it true for everyone? Nothing is impossible with God. At face value, I think we know this to be true. If we accept the concept of God, then it naturally follows that God can do whatever he wants to do as long as it's consistent with his character. So, of course, in our minds, we, believe, we know that God can do whatever he wants, so nothing is impossible with him. So while we know it up here that God can do the impossible, it seems to me in here, in our hearts, we wonder sometimes, will he do the impossible for me? I know up here that he can, but down here I wonder, will he? And so I'm not really sure that we always live, nothing is impossible with God. When we face circumstances, troubles, trials, do we face them living as if God's promises are certain and His power in the present is real? Or do we just know it and want it to be true in our hearts? I'm not sure we can even... Admit that in church. I don't know. Is it okay to say that we know it to be true in our minds, that nothing is impossible with God? We want it to be true in our hearts, but some days we're not so sure. Is God inviting me to step into the impossible with Him? And if so, what does that look like? But what I see in this passage is a young woman who is about to have the whole world against her. A young woman who is about to have a husband question her integrity and her, her purity and in all likelihood 
is li- likely to put her out. Now, we know that doesn't happen, but culturally, that's what would have been expected of Joseph. And with all of those things, this young woman is willing to believe the promises of God and believe that he has the power in the present to make it happen. And so she steps into this impossible with God. What if you and I and all of us could begin to see the whole Christmas story, not just a nice story about a census and a nice story about angels and shepherds and inns and and babies and stars, all those things that stand out to us. But what if the Christmas story is an invitation for us to move past what we know to be true, to move past what we want in our hearts to be true, and actually step into, hear God's invitation to us to step into the impossible with him. And of course, me saying, step into the impossible with God, or seeing Mary do it in the story of Christmas is easy enough. But in real life, not so much. In real life, taking that step is quite difficult. In real life, there almost needs to be a bridge that will get us from where we are to stepping into the impossible with God. Because that step is very difficult. Perhaps right now you're wondering, does God really want me to do this? Perhaps you're wondering, what does it look like for me to be like, just swept away with God and His will and knowing that? What would that look like? It, it's at the same time scary, but what if God would do the impossible if I would just go with Him? And you're wondering, should I try? And I think if we're going to step into the impossible with God, There are things that we're going, there are things in my life, things in your life, that are going to try to prevent us from doing God's will. They're going to try to prevent us from living the impossible with God. I'm going to name a few, and of course you can come up with some more examples, but I I have three that I think are always trying to stop us from taking that step. And the first one is self. If we don't get over ourselves, I'm not sure we make it to verse 38. And if we don't get over ourselves, I'm not sure we make it to verse 38 because I think ourself is always worried about what other people are going to say. Ourself is always worried about how other people are going to respond. And so if I can't get over me... I'm going to hesitate to step into what God's big plan is. So that's the first thing I have to get over myself. The second thing that gets in the way of me stepping into the impossible with God, it seems to me anyways, is anxiety and fear. Mary, of course, had both of these. I'm sure of it. How could she not, right? She just finished talking with an angel. And there's a reason the angel Gabriel had to tell her, don't be afraid. Because she was afraid. That's why he had to say that. Then what he told her wouldn't have helped. It would have made her anxious, would have made her fearful. She was not married. But the angel told her she was going to have a baby and she was to name him Jesus. I mean, she's got all kinds of stuff to be fearful about. She has all kinds of stuff to be anxious about. Right? Because people is people. They're going to be gossiping about her. They're going to be making assumptions. They're going to be filling in the gaps with what they think instead of knowing the same stuff people do today. So if she shifts her focus away from God to all that she has to be anxious about, if she shifts her focus to all that she has to be fearful about, which are legitimate, everything that we could mention from what we're told in the story are legitimate things to be anxious about and to be fearful about. But if she shifts her focus there, she's going to have a hard time getting to verse 38, where she says, yes, may it be as God has said, let me step into the impossible with God. You know it like I know it, because we've all been there. We've come up to this place where we want to say yes to God, but there's all kinds of things around us that make us wonder, should we do it? Can we step into it? What will people say? What will people think? What if it doesn't work out? All of those kind of things are here in this story. And yet, somehow Mary 
gets to yes. We've got to get over ourselves. We've got to step across our fears and our anxieties to say yes to God. And my last example, um, and I'm sure that we could come up with more, um, but for the sake of time and things, I, I just have three. I think we can miss the impossible with God when doubt gets in the way. So self, anxiety, and fear, and doubt all prevent us from stepping into the impossible with God. And the doubt I'm talking about isn't the kind that dismisses God outright. I'm talking about the more subtle kind that kind of creeps in in the hardships. The subtle kind that kind of makes us begin to wonder, well, where is God? Why am I going through this? If Mary mistakes the hardships, the temporary hardships that she's about to face as a sure sign that God's favor is not upon her, like hardship, well, God doesn't care, she would be wrong. If Mary mistakes the temporary hardships as meaning that God can't do the impossible, she would be wrong. And you know the Christmas story as well as I do. Mary and Joseph face hardships the whole time. And if doubt creeps in and they start to question the, if God is able, then they'll miss the impossible. And as I thought about this, I couldn't help but wonder if that's why sometimes we miss what God is doing. I wonder if sometimes it is doubt that prevents us from stepping into the impossible with God. I think that we've been conditioned to think in our culture anyways, and, and really we've been conditioned to think sometimes in the church that temporary hardships mean that God is not at work. That temporary hardships tend to mean that, well, God isn't going to do the impossible for me. But in Scripture, what I notice is that most often when hardships come, that is precisely when God shows up. It's almost like you can't have one without the other. Avoid hardships, never see God show up. Accept the hardships as you're trying to do the will of God and see God bring you through. It's almost like you can't have one without the other. And so when we spend our lives wanting to avoid hardship, when we spend our lives doing everything we can to avoid the troubles, to avoid the you know, the pressure that sometimes comes with doing the will of God, is it any wonder that we don't see the impossible of God? And I think that doubt plays a big part of why we want to avoid hardships for God because doubt says, well, God just might not for me or for you. And so we avoid those things. And it prevents us from seeing God show up. So if we're going to step into the impossible with God, we have to get over ourselves. We have to get over our anxieties and our fears when it comes to whether or not God is able. And then we have to prevent doubt from creeping in. Well, how do we do that? All these things make us hesitate to hesitate, and they prevent us from stepping over, on, like stepping across this bridge to where God is at work. So how do we get there? Two things that I would offer you um, as things that we need to incorporate in our lives so that we can take this step. I think first we have to build our faith. Well, what do I mean by that? I think we have to begin to move faith from just something we know on the page to the heart so that we can live it out, believing that God is able today, just like he was in Scripture, to do whatever he said he would do. And so we have to notice ways in which God is helping others to build faith. In other words, you need to hear what God is doing in my life, and I need to hear what God is doing in your life to build one another's faith. So we need to share the story of God that is taking place in our lives. As a family today, share some of what 
God is doing in your midst. Share the story of faith that is happening in your family and build each other's faith. Other things that you can do is pick up books and take time to learn about those who have done the impossible with God, right? And see what you'll discover in all of those books. Everyone that I have read is like this. You will see that they had to overcome obstacles of self and fear and obstacles of of doubt. But in stepping into the impossible and overcoming those things, they were able to see God move and they were able to do wonderful uh, things and um, that showed who God was to the world. And then, lastly, more than anything else, I think if you and I want to step into the impossible with God, which I think that you do, and I, and I want to step there, I, I, I think this is something we all want, to step into the impossible with God. But if we're going to do that, we have to know in the depths of our being that God loves us. That he really loves, not just generically, but that God loves me. And I know that sounds cliche, but it's not. God loves you. This is the last Sunday of Advent, and it's all about God's love. It's the candle of love because it's into the world in darkness, a world that didn't fully understand God's love, that God sent the light of his son. That is love. In 1 John 4, 18, um, the scriptures tells us as, as John is looking back at Jesus and reflecting on his life and writing this letter to the church, he says, perfect love casts out all fear. Not because fear is not present, but because God's love is greater than my fear. It's there, but God's love overcomes it. Christmas is about God acting in love for me and for you. And Jesus identifies with us at Christmas. He takes our place later in his life as he hangs on a cross. And at one point in his life, he says if we, that he will ask the Father for us. In other words, he'll stand in the gap between... Uh, for us and ask the Father on our behalf. All of that points to the love of God shown to us in Jesus Christ. Mary, I think, understood in our text today God's favor meant that he loved her with a never-ending love. God's favor meant that he loved her with an ever-ending love, just like God loves you with an ever-ending, never-ending love. If Mary would not have believed that, we would have never gotten to the point where she was able to say to Gabriel, may it be as you have said. She knew that God had loved her. Christmas points us and asks us to remember again that nothing is impossible with God. And if we, you and I, would let ourselves understand his love for us, and then combine that with an increasing faith, then that would become the foundation of our lives. It would be the bridge, faith and love would be the bridge that would get us over ourselves, get us over our anxiety and fear, get us over our doubts, and enable us to step into the impossible with God. Faith and love. The invitation of Christmas is to live as if God's promises for the future are certain. And God's power in the present is real. Because we know that God loves us. We have faith that this story is our story. I'm beginning to understand that Christmas is God's love. And it's his love that invites me and you right now to hear and to accept the invitation to faith. Where then in us and through us God will do the impossible, and he wants to do the impossible. And so I will re- leave you with Philippians 3.18. Now all glory to God, who is able through his mighty power at work within us to accomplish infinitely more than we might ask or think. God wants to do infinitely more, the impossible, in us and through us. My prayer today for all of us at Mountain View and for whoever else ever watches this video, is that you would know that God loves you. 
and because you know in the depths of who you are that God loves you, that you would take the chance and step into the impossible with God. Would you take that step today? You can. All you have to do is say to the Lord, I hear your invitation. And if you will be that bridge, I'll put my faith in you because I'm coming to understand how much you love me. Church, this is the invitation of Christmas. May the Lord bless you and may he keep you. May this week he give you health and many moments of laughter and joy. May your hearts be filled to overflowing with the story of Christmas. Amen and amen.